they were missing really a plate. So they got a regular plastic plate. And they see that without realizing, my wife switched the plates that would make sure that the guests that she never knew will not feel that comfortable mm. and have a different plate. I said, Avram Avinu did Achmas Asochim three days after the Bris Mila. She did three days before she passed away. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I'm Yaakov Langer, and I'm fascinated by leaders, by, by people who are out there and helping guide, whether it's a kahila, an organization, Talmidim, whatever it is, whoever it is. And Rev. Nissen Kaplan has literally thousands of Talmidim, thousands of people who look to him for guidance, for help, and for him to teach them Torah. And it's always interesting to me to see what's, what's behind the person who's having such an impact on so many people. And we got to sit down and uh, talk to Rev. Nissen about his life and and obviously the, the the challenges that that he had to face the loss of his wife and just um being being a father and uh being a rosh Shiva and uh being being a inspiration for the nation i very much enjoyed this episode and i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did this episode is in memory of shimon david ben yaakov shlema and miriam sara bas yaakov moshe and Stick around in the middle of the podcast. Stick around in the middle of the podcast. I keep making that mistake. Well, enjoy the fact that I will be talking about the good faith effort with the one, the only, Rib Ari Lam. And he shares with us his favorite, favorite episode and why it was. And you'll hear more about that. Without further ado, here's Rib Nissen Kaplan. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. I have the privilege to sit down with the Rosh Shiva. I know he's in America, and when you're in America, I think you're always busy, but especially when you're in America, there's a lot of places to be. So thank you very much for coming here to do this. With pleasure, with pleasure. If I could help different people, I'm happy to try to. Which, which we'll, we're going to get into, because I have a specific question to you about that focus in your life, about helping others. But maybe take us back to maybe where you're from, just so I could know. You're not originally from Eretz Yisrael, are you? I was born actually in Baltimore, but when I was one years old, my parents made Aliyah. And from then, I'm really in Eretz Yisrael the whole time. You're in Eretz Yisrael. Did you ever think about coming back to America? Never. Never. You're very happy in very Eretz Yisrael. Very happy to be in Eretz Yisrael, near the Kaisal, Yerushalayim. Wow. So but what could be better? So I did some research on you, and I, I've, I've seen you've been to a few yeshivas. And one of the places that you've been was uh, to Rav Shach's yeshiva. Ponovich. What, what, what was... What was your relationship with the Rev Shach like? I was learning in Yeshiva School Torah in Yerushalayim. My Rebbe was Rav Shemuel Zalman Ayabach. I was very, very close to Rav Shemuel Zalman Ayabach. And one day Rav Shemuel Zalman turns over to me and says, it's time for you to go to learn by Rav Shach. I said, it was very hard for me to leave. I was like a son by Rav Shemuel Zalman. And he said, the Valozhin of our generation is Panovich, Rav Shach is Rav Chaim Valozhiner, and I want you to go to learn by Rav Chaim Valozhiner. When I came, Rav Shach was already older, he did not say the blood cheer, so it was much harder to have a personal shaykhist to him. But the, the most that I could, I had. Wow. And, and my Rebbe was Rav Shem Zaman what, What's something about um, Rav Orbach that maybe a lot of people don't know? That a lot of people don't know, I'm not sure. Okay. I could say what is Rav Shema Zaman that he was a Rebbe and a father. Shema Zaman a member, when I came in to Shir, first day, second day, third day, and the that day, Rav Shema Zaman did not come to the yeshiva often. He would come three times a week, four times a week, and he would come a bit before he would say Shir, he would come. And that was the time that you could have to him was not enough for me. Hmm. 
So I went over to Rosh Hashanah and I said, you know, I worked it out with my father. I think every day he will give me a taxi to go from Yeshiva to your house back and forth. I don't have to go on the buses. And I could speak to you for an hour and learning. I was an innocent boy, 16 years old. I didn't know nothing, Chutzim, Rashi, and Tesis, and Gemara. Today I know about the whole world. <laughs> but then I did not know. And I said, I want to come to speak to you in learning. I have a lot of questions. An hour a day, I think we'll make it. And he told me, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm not, I'm not that type of Rosh Hashiva. It just doesn't work out like that. And I was a young boy, and I said, Rebbe, if you feel that you're not, you cannot be a Rosh Hashiva, so give the Rosh Hashiva position to someone else. <laughs> but I came to Yeshiva to learn by a Rosh Hashiva. But you weren't scared to say that to him? Like... I, I, was, I really wanted to speak to him in learning. Wow. I, I was a young boy. I had that joy of a young guy that really wanted to learn. I said, like, I don't know about today, but then I had it. <laughs> and Rosh Zaman looks at me, and he says, you know, I said, Rebbe, I'm serious. If you can't do it, give it to someone else. <laughs> and he says, I will come every day 15 minutes earlier or be belong to you. Wow. But from that day, he came into yeshiva. He took his chair in the shear. He turned it towards me until the end of the time that I learned with him. By him and shear, the shear was said to me. He felt he has a real Talmud. Did, do you think and that is the way we really developed our shaykhs and it became deeper and deeper and deeper. So he knew Kala Teirikula, was the nicest person, and he gave his Talmidim his heart, his soul, everything he gave to his Talmidim. Do you think you model the way you do things after him? After being- A lot, a lot. I think he was more calm for me. He was what? More calm. Oh, really? <laughs> You're like a little yeah, more A little more, more, more fire. Right, right. But, right. That, but the, the, the nice parts I took from him, you know? Right. Uh, the calmness, you know, I, I was not Zaycha. Have you seen someone say something along the lines of what you said to him to you? Being like, come on, I want you to make time for me. And like, I, a lot of people said it to me. I can't believe they said it in the same innocence that I said it. Really? Maybe, maybe they did, but right. I, more, you know, our generation. I'm ready, I want. I really want it. Wow. Wow, that's really beautiful. And that made us very close. So what was it like for you when he was Niftar? The sun set on the middle of the day. I toured Korea, and I was broken completely. My life changed. My Rebbe disappeared. And it was never, it was never, you know, it was very hard. I never, I never really managed to fulfill it. I never managed to fulfill it, you know. Baruch Hashem, a lot of G'daylim, a lot of Tamil Chachamim. But I lost my Rebbe. Wow. And I think it's very important to every guy to have a Rebbe. And it's interesting, you know, I'm very into giving the space. I like people. I like Talmidim. I like Bachrim. I like Ingelite. And I love to give all of my life to them. But not everyone is Zaycha to have a Rebbe. Meaning to say, even when you decide to be the Rebbe, the Talmud has to decide that he wants to be a Talmud. You have a guy that could call you for a shidduch, could call you for help, for business advice, when he has business crisis, when he has life crisis. But in the day that he makes it, he forgets about you. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't care, but he doesn't have a Rebbe. He taught that he has a Rebbe. When you have a Rebbe, like when you have a parent, they stay your parent. And it's very important to a guy, if he wants to be a good yid and not to fall later in life, not to hop rabbis. Hop rabbis means it's not a real rabbi. For now, this is good for me. <laughs> for now, right. now, sushi, tomorrow, this year I go to Orlando. When everyone starts to go to Orlando, I go to Spain. <laughs> everyone goes to Spain, back there it's Israel. No one goes to Pesach, I don't go. Everyone is going, trying to buy a house in Israel. He, I, I'm just beating the matzah. Right. First, you explain that Orlando is the best thing. Why? Because it's a short flight, it's local, it's good for the kids. Now, because a lot of people are doing it, so no, so it's not the inn. So now you have to have a higher society. So, same thing, a guy he switches his Rebbe. You can't switch your Rebbe. I, I, I love that idea, and I have my, my Rebbe is Rabbi Rav Noyach Victor. He's my Rebbe Mavak. Um, but on your end, how do you? How do you deal with it? Because every year you just get more and more Talmidim. 
Again, the ones that want to be Talmidim, stay Talmidim, doesn't make a difference how busy the Rebbe is. I did a little research, and I was talking to a few people, Avram Goldstein, Yitzhi Shachter, and many others, and they all feel like they were your favorite Talmud, and they have that relationship. How do you create that relationship? If you believe in it. If you don't fake it. You're nice to the guy, doesn't make a difference what he has, how he has, who he is. You're just dear for the people. I really like to give. I really want them to grow. I want to be with them. And hopefully one day, Be'ez HaShem, I could be with every one of them. You know, in the moment in my life, my time is a bit smaller. My time is a bit narrower. Yeah. But um, I try. I try. I have a place in my heart for everyone. And I try to reach out to everyone. And for sure to answer everyone. I'm going to dig a little deeper into like how you balance it all. But... I know your your wife passed away uh, not too long ago. First of all, what 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 was your relationship like, you and your wife? What what was she in the home? So you know, I will say what I feel is the proper to say. You know, what is not appropriate to say, I don't think I will share. Okay, that's fair. But um, I think my wife was something special, unique, that I don't think a lot of people was like. On one hand. She was a Rebetzin. On one hand, she was a very normal person. You know, we had every Shabbos in our house, 20, 30, 40 Bachrim. She cooked. We didn't have extra help. She cooked. She did dishes. We never knew how much guys would come up for Shabbos, but every boy felt. I'll tell you a story. One of the, and the, and the Shiva, a Talmud, came from the Mir. He's an Israeli, actually. And today he knows Shas, he says Shirim in Spanish. I think he has a couple thousand followers. I don't want to mention his name. And he said that was something very interesting. He came to Shir, I remember his father brought him over and said, just make my son sure that my son stays from. And I learned with him a couple of days and I see he's a genius. I said, his father, you know, your son is a genius. He could be a Tamil Chachem. He says, yeah, but he's into cars. I said, no problem, make a deal. I don't remember if he wanted a race race or something. We were speaking about 25 years ago. And I said, promise him if he finishes Shas, well, we could buy him a race race, even if he's 20 years old. Back and forth, the guy finished a half a Shas, and we settled on a Mini Cooper. <laughs> and then, you know, he upgraded himself, and he became a Choshevi guy. And every time when my wife gave birth, he would come with his fancy cars, and he would bring back my wife from the hospital to the Aim Vyelet and back to the house. And every time that I wanted, my wife said, no, no, she wants him to pick us up. The last baby we had, I wanted to call him. And my wife says, I'm sorry, a stranger will pick me up from the hospital, call a taxi. And I said, no, I'm calling that guy. She said, a stranger, I'm out of the hospital, I don't feel comfortable. And I told my rest, I don't understand. All the other birds, you asked me to. She said, I'll explain to you. All of the other birds, I felt this boy needs attention. So I want him to feel that the Rebetzin wants him to take. Now that he's saying sheer and he has followers, he doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. I don't want a stranger. I want my husband to pick me up. And this is the way. And when he came to the Shiva house, he said she would call him and ask him what kind of color couch is Kedai to buy to the house this color, that color. When he came to the house, there was no couch. And he realized she just bought him up. Hmm. And this was one of the thousands. Thousands of boys that grew up in the house, and she took care of them. Every person that was a nebach grew up in the house. But in the same time, for example, I think one of these, these one of the things that I really remember one day I was learning Maseches Shabbos. I was about to finish with Chalamoyed Pesach. I would say maybe nine years ago. No, um, maybe ten years ago. And I told my wife, I need afternoon, I need to learn some. I want to finish Maseches Shabbos. If you could take the kids out somewhere for Chalamoyed. The house gets very quiet. I'm in my office, I'm learning hours, hours. I finish to learn and I see it's very quiet. I say, such a good wife. She took everyone out for Chalamoyed Shreep. I go down, but it's too quiet. And I open the dining room room, and you know what I see inside? My parents, my brothers, my sisters. My wife made a special seal. 
because this was her life. I remember I was in Toronto three weeks before she passed away. She was already in the hospital, and she was a very, we didn't realize, and she became a very critical condition. The doctors called the kids. I couldn't even make it back. She said she will wait. And her friends came over, and they said, you don't mind that your husband went away for his yeshiva when you're so sick? She said, what? He went away for my yeshiva. Hmm. It's our yeshiva. It's our business. What do you mean he went away for his yeshiva? That is the way she was. On the other hand, she was the head of database of the whole Ichod Atzala. Really? She ran the whole place. How did she have time to... I, well, I remember when she was sick the last week, we had a huge meeting with Jewish and non-Jewish men, lady from in her room. They made all the meetings at Atzala in her room because she was running the whole Ichod Atzala, the whole system, database. Till today, it shows up in her name. Like, you know, and in the Levaya, I said something very interesting. She never let me to help her. She took care of everything. When it came to the Levaya, this was a very big Levaya, and Ichud Atzole just stepped in and took care of the whole thing because she was like one of them, mm -hmm. secular and not secular, everyone. And I said, you know, even her, I was like planning at least one time in her life to pay her back to do a beautiful Levaya, and that she also took care of. Hmm. That was her special. For example, I'll give you another something that I remember now. In her last Shabbos, it was three days before she passed away. So my daughters stayed with her for Shabbos. We had some friends, Swiss friends. So they sent all the food for Shabbos. So it was four girls and my wife. So it was five plates for little Shabbos, five soup dishes, five for Shabbos day. Everything was like Swiss, very exactly. And my daughters went to Davin in the shul in the hospital. My wife was not feeling so well. She said, we'll do the meal a bit later. And they met a friend of theirs. So she, they invited her to come to their mother's bed to eat the Suda Shabbos together with her. Mm -hmm. And they see that, so they were missing really a plate. So they got a regular plastic plate. And they see that without realizing, my wife switched the plates that would make sure that the guests that she never knew will not feel that comfortable hmm. and have a different plate. I said, Avram Avinu did Achnos Ochim three days after the Bris Miller. She did three days before she passed away. Wow. But it's these little things. No, no one cares. Everyone knows she's sick. So that was, in one hand, she was there for everyone. For everyone. From, not from, again, open-minded, ran everything, she would do everything. Mitzat Sheni, you know, she had the Rebetzin part of her. For example, the Friday before she passed away, so the doctors told me, you know, everything is not working anymore. You know, get ambulance, we'll get all the machines, we'll take her for a couple of hours out of the hospital to a mall that she'll just see the light before she dies. For sure, she refused back and forth, she said, I'll go to the Kaisal. So we put the accident, we put all the machines, and we drove to the Kaisal. And we came to the Kaisal, and she went to the wall, she davened, and my kids were listening, what she's davening. And she said, I'm sick for six and a half years. My husband could not learn like he has to. I'm going to leave soon. Make sure that he gets back to his learning. She turned over to the kids, I finished the daven, back to the hospital. Wow. These were her last words. Right. And she was really a special person, and you know, we did it together. We did everything together. Everything together we did. And you know, by, by, by day we had the seminary girls, by night we had the Bachrim, and everyone was in the house. And you know, she stood behind me, she gave me the push to learn. One thing I realized when we were sitting Shiva, so it was two o'clock in lunchtime, <laughs> and people are coming in cons consisting to Menachem Ovel. And like my kids started to tell me, you know, ta, the food is getting cold, the food is getting cold. So I started to cry. My kids asked me, why are you crying? I said, for the first time from the time I married, someone told me the food is getting cold. Hmm. We had people, I never realized wow. that my life was not a life. People would come till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, so the Shabbos, and no one told me that it's something. The first thing I realized is a world around. And if the food is getting cold, the food is getting cold. Hmm. Her father is Rabbi Avram Govitz, the Rosh right. from Gateshead. Yeah. So, you know, she really saw 
a great house, a chosh of a house. And, uh, you know, together, Baruch Hashem, we're Zechit, 11 beautiful kids. We're now in the States. We're staying in the back Lawrence. Hopefully heading to a Pesach program of Gateways. Hoping to have a nice Pesach together with Alder Rebetzin. And what advice would you give to someone? Because I'm sure there's people listening that, that have lost a loved one, whether it's their wife or, a, you know, a child or a parent. Because, you know, for anyone it's hard to go on, but for you with 11 kids and your Rosh Yeshiva, running the Yeshiva, what advice would you give to that person? So it's hard to give advice. My kids ask me the whole time. And I tell them, don't learn from me. Hmm. And they ask me, what do you mean? I said, if I would not have a yeshiva, then I would have to run a fundraise. It's very hard. It's difficult. But if I would not have that, I would not survive. Because it's so hard to be yourself, to look after your kids. Shem gave me a present that I'm running a yeshiva. I have hundreds I've told me them in my yeshiva and thousands and thousands from before. And all of them are sucking and sitting on me. I have a very hard time fundraising because I can't come and I'm running around. But I look and the thank you Hashem, making me busy and don't have time to think about myself, to feel lonely. Hmm. Thank you Hashem. Thank you, thank you Hashem. But a person that doesn't have something else to do, it's very hard to pass a loss yourself. Very hard. Harder from what you think. I told my kids a story. And we were sitting Shiva. My Rebetzin, together with myself, but I'm giving the credit to my Rebetzin. Every Yasem and Almona were living in our house. We had a tragedy in Al Nuf, a terrorist, terrorist, a terrorist attack. Some of the Yasemim just were in our house later the whole time. And I told him I heard once a story in a Leviathan, someone lost his son. And he said over a story, there was a general in Israeli Navy. Every soldier he would lose, he would come to the Leviathan, tear career, sit shiva with the family. It's like my son, you know, in the Navy, in every army, the Navy especially, they become very close because they, they could be weeks together under the water. He lost 56 soldiers. After 56 soldiers, over his career, he lost his son. Everyone came to that Leviathan. Everyone. Everyone was there that Levi. And he got up and he says, I'm asking sorry and mechila from the 56 families. I never knew what it means to lose a son. Wow. I pretended that I knew. And I told my kids, you know, we, have, we helped a lot of Yosemite. We had a lot of Almanis. We never know what it means. Till you're in it, you don't understand what it is. But a person has to take a focus. A person has to move ahead to learn a defayimi, or to learn a koilel, to do some mitzvahs, to get involved, not to let it to hit you. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, I am here with Rib Ari Lam. Rib Ari, could you tell us a little about the Good Faith Effort podcast for those who don't know what it is? Sure. The premise is simple. The Torah is amazing. And so I want to talk every single week to someone who is amazing in their field, politicians, artists, journalists, recording artists, whatever, athletes, whatever it is, about how some theme from the Torah influences and informs and enlightens the work that they do, which is top quality in their field. I love that. And, and okay, so this, this moment this week is very magical because one of the guests of Inspiration for the Nation, the Red Hood of Auschwitz, uh, Nechama Birnbaum, who has over 107,000 107, Instagram followers, which is nuts. I like made sure I read that right. Um, she shared on on her uh, Instagram story. I highly recommend this podcast episode. I love listening uh, to uh, Dina Sussman on Good Faith Effort. Thank you, Living Lachaim, for introducing them. Okay, so first of all, it's like I don't know. I, it's like a catch twenty two. Like I mentioned it on the podcast that she was on, and she went to listen, and then she shared it with her whole audience. But uh, Dina Sussman, what what was so magical about that episode? That is the ep episode where I most frequently get the listener. I mean, our listeners are amazing. They're always in contact. That's the episode where I most frequently get the feedback of, did not think this episode would be good at all. It ended up being my favorite episode of the podcast. She was so insightful. I mean, Adina Sussman, obviously, you know, world famous chef and you know, my wife is obsessed with her Instagram, but you know, from a, a 
content, a substantive standpoint. I just, I just, I thought we'd talk a little bit about food. What are your, your favorite foods, Jewish foods, Israeli foods? It ended up being about education, about, about the unique way that you can actually learn about values, traditions, Torah through being in a kitchen, through imbibing and absorbing the lessons and traditions of the people who came before you, of actually taking traditions from different backgrounds and melding them together into something new and beautiful that that looks forward to the future but has the tastes and smells of the old. It just was an amazing episode. She's brilliant. Yeah, I think I think the reason why people resonated so much with this episode is because it's the essence of what the Good Faith Effort podcast is, of like, you think you're coming in for one thing, and then all of a sudden, you get to really understand the magic of what it is to be like, you know, Jewish or just read through the Bible, get the lessons, you know, if it was obvious, then it wouldn't be such a good lesson, you know? Exactly. I mean, she's the kind of person who, in very much in the spirit of the Good Faith Effort pod, is so out there and proud of the values that she represents. So during the course of COVID, she told us on the pod, she was living with John Legend and Chrissy Teigen. She was living in their house. Like for, she quarantined with them for all of COVID and they're working on recipes and so on. And she just says, you know, they're asking me questions about Hanukkah. They're asking me questions about the Torah. And I just get to be out there and bring that into everything I do in the most excellent way possible. And that's the spirit of the podcast, bringing our values into everything with excellence and pride. I love that. Could you give us a little teaser of what is to come? You guys are always planning something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we we just dropped an episode with Kel from Kenan and Kel and, and all that. Star of Good Burger, my favorite movie as a kid. He's unbelievable. Uh, we talked about his uh, his perspective on the Bible and faith. It was amazing. And next week we have uh, Warren Campbell, 10-time Grammy winner. Um, he is uh, Kanye's producer, just won a Grammy for producing Kanye's latest record. Um, he is one of the biggest legends in the music industry. And he's also uh, a person of deep faith, cares a great deal about the Bible, is now learning a lot about Israel and the Jewish people. And is super fascinated by all of it. It was probably my favorite conversation in the in the history of the podcast. So look forward to that. Wow. Okay. I am so excited and happy to listen to it. And if you have not yet checked out the Good Faith Effort, everyone listening or watching, go check them out. They're on wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. All of them. Ravari, thank you so much. And everyone, now back to this week's episode. So I, I want to talk about your yeshiva because you know when I was in Eretz I was there for about six years, you were a maggot chair in the mirror. What made you decide to say, okay, I want to open up my own yeshiva? Like, it's a daunting task. You, you know, someone would say like, okay, you, you have it. You have your Talmudim. You're good to go. What, what made you say, it's time for my own yeshiva? So the mirror is a great place. I really think it's a very special yeshiva, very special staff, a very special rabbeim, and for sure, Rosh Hashiva, and the uh, Rosh Hashiva today, and Bez and the Gedalim told me at that time that it's very important to open a yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, starting by Israelis, hopefully, and the Hemshech following by American boys. The Americans are waiting. They're you waiting. Know, and yeah. we'll be there. We'll be there. And the day that we will have the funding complete for the Israeli yeshiva and someone that will help in the funding of the American yeshiva, we will move ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not rushing because I, have, I was planning to do it quicker. I have my family. I have teaching in my yeshiva, funding my yeshiva, and to open a yeshiva for Americans and to give them all of the love and the time, I have to have a menucha sanefesh mm -hmm. and not to pretend that I could do it. I don't want to pretend. I want to do it that they will grow and have a success. And the Rabbi and Gedalim felt in that time that it's needed in Eretz Yisrael, a yeshiva, for good boys, the ones that will be the next Rosh Yeshivas, but with love, I will call it with the American touch. Hmm. I'll give you an example. An our yeshiva, comes the winter, every night, every little Shabbos, we finish, the suda starts 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, all of the yeshiva learns from 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock by night. Every little Shabbos has a seder of 6 hours. Everyone comes. What is the secret? I, don't know. I sit there with them. Ah. 1 o'clock, when they finish, they make a meal. Because six hours passed. Wow. But they could, they funded themselves, the boys, because they feel it's theirs. Mm. And every week they told me, come down to see our meal. But six, it's more from Lel Shavuos, every Lel Shabbos. For example, before Rosh Hashanah, so you know, Elul is very tense. 
especially in a yeshiva that most guys learn 10, 12 hours a day, and the slichus of Erev Rosh Hashanah, three hours, I think if you put a match into Bismedrash, it could lit. <laughs> I told the boys, after davening, I wanted to pass through my office. Everyone got very nervous. I had in the office ready for them 250 bags, two sodas, a big bamba, bisli, honey cake, candies. And for every boy that passed, I said a word to him, how he's doing good, and I gave him from the rabbits, and I said, not all of them get packages, not all of them. I got phone calls. My son is a month in yeshiva. He never had time to call home. He's learning. But he called to say that he got a bamba. Everyone needs loves. In our generation, we have a mistake. The guy that's learning good, let him to suffer. The guy's off the derech, take care of him, boating, booting, everything. Mm -hmm. Jet ski, tubing. I'm not saying the good boy doesn't need that. But he needs love, gishmak. And if we will give that to the Choshiva guys, the whole generation will have it. I thought it would take a lot of times that the Choshiva guys, and I said, well, I have over a thousand applications for next month. Wow, that is a lot. Oh, I'm not, I'm doing it slowly. We have 250 boys in Yeshiva now. And that is the catch, really. It's very stark in learning, very warm, like one family. That, and they don't tell me, in the American world, it's existing already. Right. You, you could do it also, but they don't need only you. In the Israeli yeshiva, they need someone that they look up to, that they think that he's very from, that they think that he's very stark, but that he could give it. Now, you can't pretend it. You have to like it. Now, I like to do it. Like, you know, Mordechai Bedevi knows how to sing. Mm -hmm. Even Yisha Riva, I think, knows how to sing. Yeah. I, you know, I mentioned his name. I, was, I, I have to say my appreciation. My wife liked his song, Hakoanim Vaham, because I'm a Kayan. And she, her dream was that I'll be the Kayan God. Wow. And I, before she died, 24 hours, she said, I want to hear Yishai Riva singing, singing it. And I don't have money. And I called Yishai Riva, and he said, I'll be there. Wow. And for two hours, he sat near her bed. And I'm telling you, I didn't pay him a dollar. Wow. And he just sang for Hakoanim Vaham, and I have it in video. And that was really the last, the last thing. Wow. So I mentioned his name, so I'm using... He, the, I, I'm not sure the order of releasing, he, he's going to be on this, this program as well. Okay, I'm, 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 not, I'm not going into that, but right, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just explaining that um, I just mentioned his name, so I wanted to say that, of course. Wow, that's very nice. Um, but anyways, that, um, that is the idea. The idea is really that the boys, and if you want the next generation to have that... One hand, stark learning and warmness, and to give it to the next generation, that is really what the yeshiva is. That's, that's beautiful. I, I, I have like a few stories about you that I want to know. It's, don't worry, it's nothing crazy, but I want to know if this actually did happen. And you probably are anticipating what I'm going to ask. You got stuck. I don't know if you were on a flight, before a flight. Could you say over that story and turned into like a whole... I don't, I don't know what story you're from. Like, like it turned into with a bunch of Russians. Okay, that story I could say over. That story is yeah, not. yeah, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not okay, okay, okay exactly. exactly. I have a lot of stories. stories, not all of them I could share, but that I could share. Right. This story goes back, I would say, 10, 15 years ago. And I was in Newark Air, but I'm a client, so I don't take every flight. I only take quick flights that are I may seem free. Mm -hmm. We have from Newark, Elal, noon time is Mason Free. It's Yom Hamishi, it's Thursday, I think, mm -hmm. Belaz, right? Yom Hamishi is Thursday, Belaz. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> the days in English I'm not so good in. Right. I know Sunday, I know, is the first one, and Fridays, and Shabbos is Shabbos. Right, know. right. Yeah. But and the, anyways, and I'm there, and the flight has to take place 2.30, and it gets slower and slower, later and later. And another delay, and another delay, arriving at Israel 6, 7, 8. It's like a salami, you know, the Yitzhak takes one, okay, 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 9 o'clock, you know, the salami is slowly sliced, slowly. Right. And then make sure this flight is going to leave tomorrow morning sometime at 1 o'clock by night. We're arriving half an hour before Shkia. It's impossible. We go over to the pilot, he says, I will do it quicker, don't worry. It's not true. So we decided, we, I'm not taking the flight. There's no question about it. It was a group of birthright. Mm -hmm. One of the more secular groups. They have all different kind of groups. And they're with me. And they had a boy and a girl that were running, the leading the group. And they came over to me, Rabbi, what do we do? I said, 
you know, the pilot says that he will do it quicker and he will put them in a hotel in Ben Gurion. Till today, I never found that hotel, but they will put him in a hotel in Ben Gurion. So I said, well, you know, owe you a circle and a half a circle, run by Rabbi Belsky. Let me to call Rabbi Belsky. So we call Rabbi Belsky, and Rabbi Belsky says, you're not allowed to take the flight. And I tell these kids, you're not allowed to take the flight. And the kids say, listen, Rabbi, you will go back to Lakewood. We came from Moyaki, all, you know, the end of the world. Right. And if you're staying with us for Shabbos, we stay. <laughs> if you're not staying with us for Shabbos, we will not stay. I called my Rebbe and I said, you know what? I will stay with you for Shabbos in Ramada Inn. They put us in Ramada Inn for Shabbos. And we're starting to organize. You know, I need, uh, I wake up in the morning after a whole night that everyone is there. You know, the airport back and forth, the airline, they left with our suitcases. The suitcases were on the plane. They left, it's against every rule, but they left with our suitcases. And make the story short, we're in Ramada Inn. I wake up in the morning and I can't open my eyes, you know, after a whole night, you know how it looked there. And I call my Rebbe Nazisro, the Shmir Shabbos Kilchoso, and I ask him, I have to stay with them? I don't think it's good for my Shmir Sanaim. He says, you gave your word, you're staying. So anyway, so I started to organize my Shabbos, and I called one Talmud, I think his name is Shraggy Feldman, he came with a group of boys, but I said, no Kirov, you're only with me for the Maminian. <laughs> and another... Talmud, and I asked him to bring a Sefer So we bring a Sefer and I didn't know where we would put the Sefer because, you know, we can't lock the doors because there's no Shabbos keys. So I asked the manager if we could put, we have the real Bible, if we could put it in your office. He said, for sure. He calls it called, and the second the guys come with tablecloths, put flowers around, you know, the real Bible is here. Right. <laughs> and like, I feel like, in the minute I'm about to go out of the room, the guy gives me a tap in my back. Rabbi, we're allowed to peek. You're allowed to what? Well, I to, I'm allowed to peek inside? Oh, look at the Torah. Like I'm thinking to myself, like, now what will happen? A guy will touch the Torah, you know, we can't let it, what? Mm -hmm. And I told him, listen, you're allowed to, but I want to tell you, sometimes when you touch it without permission, it buzzes. Mm -hmm. So just be careful. <laughs> From that minute, he didn't come close to the table because he didn't know from where the senses started to right. work. Okay. Anyway... We're getting ready for Shabbos. You know, we had someone that bought a, two people that bought a chant and that. And Lel Shabbos, I'm standing in the shul and I'm telling them, you know, Likra Shabbos Sometimes, how you know if someone loves you? If you come for him, like when I came here to meet you, you were made, waiting for me downstairs. I know you want this to happen. Sometimes the guy is inside. Maybe sometimes you come, the door is locked. You know, you're not welcome. <laughs> Sometimes you come for Shabbos, like you guys, last Shabbos, you're in the hockey game or somewhere. Shabbos knows she's not welcome. Sometimes you just jump out of the shower the last minute. Shabbos is not sure. Sometimes you're waiting for Shabbos. You want to tell your kids, you took a decision 24 hours before Shabbos to say, Shabbos, we love you. You know how Shabbos feels touched by you this Shabbos? Come, I will teach you quickly the rules, and we will try together, boys and girls together, holding for Shabbos and telling Shabbos we love you. And we went over the rules. Like I was telling them, you know, we can't use the elevators. We have emergency doors, two in the front, two in the back. Mm -hmm. And we had a meal. Make the story short, two o'clock by night, I feel responsible, responsible because I told the kids not to lock the doors because we can't get in in Shabbos. To make sure that everything is okay, I decided I will walk down. It was a Ramada Inn in Newark. So I'm walking down 2 o'clock by night in the emergency steps. It's very scary. 2 o'clock by night. And you don't have like a cell phone or anything? No, like right. it's Shabbos. Right, right, like right. I keep Shabbos. Right. <laughs> and I'm walking down and I hear someone is coming up. I didn't think I would make it anymore because who is there at 2 o'clock by night in the back steps? Mm -hmm. And I said, Rebbe at least cover his soil. <laughs> you know, I could be dead here, no one will ever know that I was killed. <laughs> right. And I'm walking down, and in front of me come two girls from the program, holding their hands, shivering exactly like me, and telling me, Rabbi, keeping Shabbos for the first time. Shabbos goes along, it's a long Shabbos, and, you know, we don't have all the time in the world to go in. Mostly Shabbos, we became very close. 
slowly, slowly, you know, it was separate, slowly, slowly, and, and it was really, and the kids came over to me in the end of Shabbos, and they wanted to keep up Shaykhis with me. And I knew if I will keep up with them Shaykhis, I will become a big Baal Tshuva guy, but I will stop to learn, and it's not my job. And I know that I did a lot for these kids, and here's this girl and boy that could take care of them. So Hashem is not looking for me, because it's not my job. You know, some people, this is their job. They sit in campus, they have to, but I have a, I have a responsibility if thousands of Yeshiva Bochim. I, I don't have a place for both. So I did not take no one's number, and I just dive into Hashem that it will follow with this boy and girl. I'm, two years later, I'm eating by someone in five towns in Shabbos, and the guy looks at me, a guy with a hat and jacket, Rabbi Kaplan? I say, yes. He says, Ramada Inn? I say, yes. He said, I was on the birth rate trip. Wow. We came to Eretz Yisrael. 98% of us stayed in Eretz Yisrael. We became Shemri Shabbos. So this is the Ramada in story. I'm sure the cure programs are all going after you. They're like, yeah, you know, but because I did it from my heart, right? And I didn't look. Hashem finished. In life, not every time you have to finish. You have to start for sure. If there will be no guys that will take care of them, I would have to do it. It's my mitzvah. But they had that special couple that was with them. If it's a couple, it was a boy and a girl that were there with them to help. And Hashem, it happened. Another story I want to bring up. I don't think this is controversial, but I, I wanted to ask it. We can edit it out if you don't feel comfortable. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't always take mitzvahs as serious as they should. There's a famous story about you and keeping the mitzvah of yichud. The story is true. I, I don't really want in public. My wife did not like when that story, everyone spoke about it. Ah. Because they said, like, wow, she's so stupid. She married me even after I wanted to jump out of the train. <laughs> no, she saw the cheshiva. Exactly, thing. exactly, exactly. But she felt like, man, if she, I don't know, feel that she's stupid. I don't understand how chashiv she is. So she didn't like it. But the story happened. The story happened. Confirmed. Wow. Wow. What, what was your father's influence on you? I know you were very close to your father. My father is my Rebbe. My father was born in Chicago, and he was a Baltimore Talmud. He learned Chavrusa, I think, for three, four years with Rav Ruderman every day for over an hour and a half, and with Rav David Krongras for over an hour and a half. Uh, I think my father is one of the Lamedvov Tzadikim. He's a mashgiach in my yeshiva today, even that he's really? in his 90s. Wow. And the boys love him. Now, Coven, he's a little bit, um, he's a little bit Coven because he had some problems in his lungs, mm. so he really keeps distance, but he's there. And he's my role model. He's really something very, very special. His name is Naftali Kaplan. He was the head of the Mechina in Baltimore over 50 years ago. And he's a special person. That's really beautiful. What, what's a parting message for those listening who, who want to connect with us? You know what? Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask. Actually, I like asking fun questions. So we'll get to there. First off, I didn't give you a warning for this. I typically do give people warnings. If there's one person in history who's no longer with us, who would you want? You could sit down with them for an hour. It could be from Adam's time until now. Who would you sit down with for an hour? Rab Kiveiger. Yeah? What I, would, I, I want to meet Rab Kiveiger. What would you discuss I with don't him? Know, or I, you'd I, learn with, what would you I, want to learn I, with I, him? I will ask him to learn with him for an hour. My what dream, would you learn with him? I don't know. My dream is to learn with Rab Kiveiger. Why? What, what's about him? I think it's tremendous amkis in Torah and godless in Torah. Even that I'm sure that if he would be here, I would be scared to go over <laughs> Maybe like, you could just look at him. You know? Like, you know, like all these people say, the Chafetz Chaim would be here, I would ask him, you would never go. <laughs> so, but my dream is to be with Rabbi Kiveger. Okay, so I, I, the 613 mitzvahs, is there a specific mitzvah now, maybe today, or maybe the past few years, that it holds a more dear place in your heart? I'll tell you, every year has to have a specific mitzvah. The Haredim brings down, I had a kvias with a bacher, his name is Villiger, I don't know why he's not keeping up with enough shaykh. <laughs> maybe he'll be listening. Maybe he will listen and he will come back. Right. But we will learn Haredim. Sefer Haredim was like 400 years ago. And I think in chapter, maybe Samach Vov, maybe Nun Vov, but you know, they'll check it up. He brings that every Jewish person has to have one mitzvah that it's his baby. His baby. He learns Pshat, he says a mushal. It's a tree in the water. 
a big tree, you try to catch onto him and pull him out with so many branches, you will never manage. If you put your hands on one branch and pull strong a good branch, you will take out the whole tree. A 613 mitzvahs, but a year has to have one mitzvah that that mitzvah pulls him out. Pulls him out completely. And he speaks down, one of the Amaroim says, tastily will happen that I, that I kept tzitzis. The one says, tapingly that I never went without the yarmulke. Tastily that I did kibbutah. What it means. They did all the mitzvahs. They had a specific mitzvah. And I was learning with this guy, and I told the guy, no, you have a mitzvah? No. I said, we'll learn it again. A week passed. I asked him, you have a mitzvah? He said, no. I said, we'll learn it again. And the third week... Um, we're about to learn, and I got a message that a Talmud of mine is sitting Shiva in the Ve I think it's from Mar. And I went to Menachem Ovel, I came to that house, and I see outside the sign. His father passed when he was 50, 53. And it says, Ben, and his father, Hashem Yin Kaim Domoy. means that his grandfather was killed in Kiddush Hashem. Now, it can be in the Holocaust because his father is 53. Mm-hmm. So I come in and I ask him, Tell me, what is the, I didn't want to talk to him. Tell me the story about your grandfather. He says, what, you really want to hear the whole family story? I said, I want to. He says, you sure you want to? I said, yeah, tell me about your dad. He says, my father was a Bolshev. He lived in Buffalo. You know where's Buffalo? It's and the near, end of the world yeah. left. <laughs> Maybe not today. It's near like Niagara Falls. Yeah, and the end of the world left, he right, said. Okay. He lived there. He was not from completely. His father was killed in the park. His father had a chemist, a drugstore, and he was killed, a robbery or something, when he was 16 years old. It was very shocking to him. He came to Yerushalayim. He went into Eshat and he said he had some questions. And Mel said, you know, the way it is, you have to learn a blood Gemara, and then he will answer. My father refused. He went back to America, to Buffalo, with his questions. And Mary Kahana showed up. Hmm. I'm saying the story like it is, don't get my desk and nothing. And he went into Americana, and Americana answered all of his questions, and he decided to become from. It was an older friend and family that helped. And my father became from. For living, he was a Mashiach Kashras. Don't know about what Kashras. And he would work in the morning. He would put on tefillin two minutes before Mincha. A guy comes in and tells him, Kid, tefillin is in the morning. He said, yeah, I forgot. I forgot morning. I put a, he didn't want to say. And the kid said, you forgot to put on tefillin? The guy picks up his arm. Shows him the number from Auschwitz. Mm. Says, I was six years in the camp. I never missed a day of tefillin. My job was to take garbage from point A to point B. It was two guards. It was one place in the middle that two guards didn't see. I would pull out the tefillin and put it for a second. If I would be caught, I would be killed. And you forgot to put on tefillin? It choked my father so much, and my father decided to take all of his spending. He went over to the Rav of Buffalo. By the way, I said over that story, and the son of the Rav was there and confirmed that he remembered the wow. mass. Wow, wow. I said, that day, I said, over in Yeshiva, and was a guy. Anyways, and I gave, my father gave all of his savings. They flew together to New York, to Eichler's, bought the most Mohuna tefillin, and from then, tefillin is his baby. Mm. This is his mitzvah. He buys us the best tefillin, everything. Make the story short. A week and a half ago, my grandmother passed away. Oh. My father flew to Buffalo. Buffalo. He finished Sitchiva, and the guy that took care of him, the neighbor, passed away. I don't think I was even from or not. My father stayed to take care of the Leviah and everything. Funeral. And it was 12 o'clock. My father finished 10 o'clock. He didn't put on tefillin yet. He had two more hours. So people told him he's Isaac by Mitzvah. He said, no, but he can't miss tefillin. He drove an hour to the house to put on his tefillin, drove an hour back, got there to the time to the Levaya, got up and said, I really have so much Akar Satoiv. He got a heart attack and died on the spot. Wow. The last Mitzvah he did was tefillin. Wow. They called us in the Chavah Kadisha in Buffalo, where we want him to be buried. And that day, everyone was in Haram Nuches. Harazesim was hard. Today, it's the opposite. <laughs> And my brother said that two weeks ago, my father said if he passes away, he wants to be in Al-Azizim. They looked, they couldn't find, and they found like a one piece that is one place. In Yerushalayim, the family doesn't go with the mitah. So they buried him there. We asked to get a picture of the place. He was buried near another single guy. You know who was the guy? Give a guess. Guys, give a guess. Hmm. 
the guy that was in the Holocaust with the tefillin. No way. And they're laying near each other. Wow. Two people that were moist on nefesh for one mitzvah. Wow. One in the camps and one in the American life. Every guy has to pick a mitzvah. That's and wild. I, and I want to tell you, look at the Haredim. And the guys ask me, sukkah could be my mitzvah? They think, they think, I say, yes. No trips in sukkah. Drinking in the sukkah. Sleeping in the sukkah. Eventually doing sukkah chazanish. Eventually learning Mishnah Guru Yilchus A guy said, Tzedak is my mitzvah. Yeah. Giving to everyone. To every rabbi. Quietly. You, you could choose every mitzvah you want, but you have to do it behidu. Tfilin. Yeah, but not talking with tfilin. The whole davening. Eventually tfilin Rabbi Lutam. Every year takes a mitzvah. And that mitzvah could change your life. So what's the Rashiva's mitzvah? So... It's a personal question. It's a personal question. Yeah, I really don't want to share it. Shabbos is really my mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Shabbos is my main mitzvah. And a couple more things with the years that I took on it. I prefer, you know, when I come up to the Shemayim to get paid for it, not in this world. Okay, very nice. Okay, I'm going to ask a last question, but I remembered one other thing. Um, I don't want to ruin the story. You, you once have a Misa where you came home very late and your wife asked you where you were and you said, oh... Right, I said that story. I say it's a marshal. I, I don't say that it happened. I said it's a marshal. Okay, so what's the marshal? The marshal is a person has to know what is chashivas of learning. Talmud Torah keneged kulam. A person does a lot of mitzvahs, but learning Torah is more from everything. The Taz says that Mordechai Atzadik, his seat was number three in the Sanhedrin. After the Megillah, it became number five, because if Hashem would love his learning, he would learn, and someone else would do the Megillah. Even that he saved Gans Klal Yisrael. For Hashem. Every time it's Hashem. Because Talmud Torah, if we would understand the chashivas of learning, we would never stop to learn. For example, if you would see a kid drown, drowning in a swimming pool, I don't know if you had that opportunity once to jump in to save a kid. You had that opportunity? I was a lifeguard, so I don't know how drastic it was. But yeah, yeah, but... Yeah, but, but it, it was, yeah, man, it, was man. In a, it was in a scenario where like right. it wasn't right. I didn't have the real deal. Someone. But if you drowned. do that, you feel so good for a year. You don't have to do mitzvahs. Right. I and, did a Heimlich maneuver on my good friend right. Shmuley. I won't say his last name. And then yeah, I felt I, like he wasn't. He was bottling. I'm like Shmuley, got to be learning. I, these are my schlusim now. You know. Now what would be if that guy that you saved becomes a Moshe Feinstein? I, wow. think, I think for ten years. You right. 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 If you will understand that Talmud Torah is more from that, you will never stop to learn. Hmm. You will not be jealous if this guy is doing this and this. I'm learning. Talmud Torah can make it kulam. David Amelech says, What do you think David Amelech wanted to do with Alfa Zov Chesef? To buy a private jack? To buy a yach? No, he was planning to, to support her. Mm-hmm. But Talmud Torah is can make it kulam. If you would realize how Choshev is to learn, you would never stop. So, what, what's the marshal that you. So, I got married. I'm saying it's a marshal. And I wanted to learn. My wife wanted a husband. So we made a deal. I could learn till 1 o'clock. And from 6 o'clock in the morning, I think it's fair, five hours home every night, not once a week. Every night. You know, guys go work. They go to... Uh, yeah, they go on the road. And, 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 right. and, and I every night. One night, I show up 2 o'clock instead of 1 o'clock. My Revitson says, it's not the deal. We made up 1 o'clock. I said, yeah, outside the house, I saw a bus tipped over. 20 people flipped out. I went mouth to mouth, and I know exactly I was blowing till the ambulance came. I'm sorry I was late. My wife said, I'm so proud of you, my husband. Kol akavot. I said, now I'll tell you a secret. I did something a little bit better. I learned the extra hour. How proud are you now? <laughs> and you know why you can, normal people can't say it to their wife? Because they themselves don't feel like that. You mm-hmm. only could say it if you really believe like that. Mm-hmm. But when you believe like that, there's no Nisoyan to learn. The Nisoyan is to put it in your head that that is the way. But if you realize that, you'll have the Siyat HaDishmai. So my last question is, is you're, you're definitely someone who, who has a strong place in his heart for Ahavas Yisrael, making time for people, making sure they feel good no matter what, even with nothing in return, just for that idea. Someone who's maybe struggling with this, or maybe someone who's going through Machlekes, and they just have a hard time doing that. What, what advice would you give to them to be, that they could be better at loving every year? To try to be nice to people for no reason. The minute you're in camp, before you leave to go to the cook and say it was amazing. 
You go into a taxi and tell the guy, oh, you look so good today. You make him to feel like a million dollars. Why not? Mm-hmm. Why not? You hear a class, a share from someone, tell him, wow, it's amazing. It doesn't make a difference if it is or not. Tell your in-laws, oh, wow, beautiful Shabbos. But not only because you want to be good with them. Mm-hmm. Tell your father-in-law. Tell their abane of your son. You finish. In the middle of the year, maybe you don't want to tell them because they're not doing a good job or doing a good job. <laughs> in the end of the year, you call them, wow. Forget about it. If you have money, you can give them money, but it's not a point about the money. I, I, I much appreciate you changed my son's life. Ma echpat lecha. Make him to feel good. Mm-hmm. That's really like now we finish the I can tell you, wow, I was never interviewed by someone so nice like you. Wow. So you feel good. But, are you but saying- why I can't say it? Forget about that now if I mean it or not. <laughs> But you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. And, and the same thing, you could tell me, wow, I never interviewed someone like I'm you. I really, I but, am but, but, really but interested But I'm trying to explain right. how you could do it 24 hours 7. Wow. And you get used to it. You train yourself. Be nice for being nice. Let the other person to feel good about himself. And remember, no one takes from you. No one takes from you. What you have to get, you will get anyways. And what you don't have to get, you will never get. Thank you, Rosh Shiva. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. A special thank you to Avram Goldstein and uh, Yankee Sachs for actually making this happen. Uh, it was interesting. I, I, I met Rev Nissen before. I, ch- I tried to explain to him what a podcast is. Um, I'm still not sure if he actually knew what it was before, but had a really great pre-conversation with him. And um, I'm very thankful to Avram and Yanki for helping make the connection. And if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and share it with someone that you think it could impact their lives. It's, it's really unknown how and why people get inspired. And if, if it works for you, maybe it'll work for your friend that you're close with or your family member or someone who just needs the chizek or someone who went through loss or someone who is just going through life and they could use something a little extra. Go ahead, leave a comment on this YouTube video if you're watching this because I want to hear your thoughts. Maybe your favorite moment, maybe a question you wished I would have asked. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, go ahead and rate or review five stars. Also subscribe if you haven't yet. And check out the other podcasts in Living Left High, whether it's Kosher Money, The Spirit of the Song, Not Your Typical Podcast with Charlene Amanoff, or That's an Issue. And there's more coming. So stick around for more goodness and keep on being an inspiration for the nation. Nah, I don't like that catchphrase. But until next time. Living L'chaim.